Hey everybody, welcome back to the Rust Beginner Tutorial on Coding and Crypto. So if you made it this far, we've covered a lot of really great basic topics. And now we're going to actually build something. We're going to build a sample application much more robust than the first one we did. That's going to encompass a lot of that stuff that we've seen in this tutorial. So what are we going to build? Well, it looks like this. We're going to build a little blockchain querying app. So we're going to look up information from the Bitcoin blockchain and we're going to do stuff with it and come up with some, I guess, conclusions in our Rust application. So you can see here from this diagram, you know, this is what our app is going to do. We're going to figure out what chain we're using from the Bitcoin blockchain. So is it the main net? Is it a test net? Like whatever. Then we're going to look up some information about a particular wallet address. And that's going to give us all of the transaction hashes that that wallet's done. So then we'll look up each of those transaction hashes. And finally, we'll use all that information to calculate that wallet's current balance. So it'll be super cool. You're basically going to be doing a parsing of the blockchain to find out how much Bitcoin your wallet has. And if you have a wallet that uses the same address every transaction, then this thing is extremely accurate. It's going to, it's all on the network. So it's going to give you that return value. So pretty cool. What you're going to need to do this is obviously you're going to need a Bitcoin wallet address to look up, to plug into this thing, to get some information about. So you can create one, you can use one of your own, and we're going to actually protect the wallet address and the API key in a certain way to use environment variables in Rust. So I'll show you that. So you don't have to worry about this getting off of your computer. Um, but anyway, so the way we're going to query the Bitcoin blockchain is we're going to use an API called NowNodes API. And so all you have to do is go to nownodes.io and you can get a free API key just by putting in your email here. Like I've already done this, so I'm not going to do it right now, but it's that easy. They'll just email you an API key and it's free to use. And you could look up all kinds of information on the blockchain. So once you've generated an API key, if you know how to use Postman, this is super easy to use with Postman. If you want to test this out, if you want to explore this API some more, all you've got to do is go to Docs and then click Run in Postman. And what that's going to do is that's going to actually download the collection, which you can see I have right here, to your Postman app. And you'll be able to use all of these different requests. And you just go in into the group here and you just put your API key in just like this. You write API dash key and put your key right here in the value section. And that will give that authorization to everything in this group here. So all of your requests here will be able to inherit this auth and you'll be able, and don't forget to set this to API key and you'll be able to use all these different get requests and see what's going on on the chain. So to start, just to show you what this is going to look like, if we hit the status endpoint, there's no payload or anything. We just hit get. You can see it gives us information about the Bitcoin chain. So what coin are we using? Bitcoin. And then if you scroll down, what chain? Main. So we're going to get some information from this request to talk about like what chain we're on. And then you saw the next is we're going to look up our wallet address stuff. So if you just put in an address up here in the URL, you can get back information about your wallet. And there's just a little example wallet I have. And here's three transactions that I've conducted. And so with these transaction hashes, we can actually go to the get transaction, plug it in up here and hit it. And you can see it'll give you the whole transaction that or it'll give you the block that your transactions a part of. So super cool. And these are the three endpoints that we're going to use in our app here. So feel free to download this collection and to mess around with all this stuff. There's a lot of different endpoints in here. There's two different APIs actually. So go crazy. Um, but we'll come back to this Postman screen a few times as we talk about like what we're doing in Rust. So let's dive into the code. So now we're back here in Visual Studio Code again, and we're using the same project that we had before. You can see our previous two applications in here. And of course, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do cargo new, and I'm just gonna call this thing blockchain info app. So we'll generate that new cargo project. And you can see it was created up here. And now we're going to take a look at how we start building this thing. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually pull in a few dependencies that are going to help us do a few things with this app. So first of all, you're going to need dependencies to make REST requests. Like we're going to need some libraries to be able to hit those endpoints from now nodes and get the information back. So what that looks like is we're going to put these three dependencies in here. And just so you guys know, I'm going to copy some of this stuff from my GitHub. The code is available on GitHub in the description. The link is there. Feel free to take a look and you can even copy paste some stuff as we go. If you don't feel like typing everything out, because some stuff is going to get a little extensive. But in a nutshell, what these dependencies are doing is they're allowing us to make requests. That's what request is going to do. And then Tokyo and the async STD. Tokyo is really what enables you to make asynchronous requests. So like you don't necessarily have to do them one by one. You could do them on multiple threads, which is called parallel processing, but we're not gonna dive a whole lot into that. But bring these in, make sure you get the versions correct because they do need to be compatible. And so when we go and hit these endpoints, you can see that we're getting a JSON payload back. So what you can do in Rust and actually in a lot of programming languages is you can actually serialize these JSON bodies into objects. And so if this looks at all like familiar to you after we've covered structs, then that's extremely astute because what we can actually do is we can deserialize this JSON body into a struct object. And that's like one of the big uses for structs, you know? So we're gonna see that live. But in order to do that, in order to take a JSON payload and convert it into a Rust struct, we're also gonna add these bad boys here, which is called Serde. And these are different Serde libraries. And that's basically what this is going to enable us to do, is turn our JSON bodies into struct objects and be able to use them in our Rust app. Now the last dependency I wanna add, I mentioned this a little bit, is the ability to use environment variables in your application. We're gonna use .env. So once you've got all these in there, go ahead and save it. And next time we do a cargo run or a cargo build, these will all get pulled in. So let's go ahead and just take a look at that real quick. We'll CD into blockchain info app, and we'll just do cargo build. And we'll see all that stuff being imported right there. Awesome. So now while this is going on, I'm going to flip back to the app here. And for the first time, you guys are going to see how to use multiple Rust files in the same application. Like we're going to drive this thing from main RS, but we're going to have other Rust modules in our source folder that we're going to be able to use. So you're going to get a good taste of what that looks like. So to start, we're going to ignore main for now. And we're going to create some Rust files that are going to actually hold our structs that are going to process the information from those payloads. So the first one we hit was the status endpoint. So let's just do blockchain status.rs and let's go back to what that looks like. So this is what our payload looks like here when we hit the blockchain status endpoint. So what you want to do to be able to deserialize this is you want to create a struct that actually has matching fields. And it's pretty much that simple. You add an annotation and you create the struct to mimic the structure of this JSON body. So we're gonna do exactly that. Now, like I said, a lot of this is on GitHub and I'm not gonna make you guys watch me type out the whole struct. So I'm gonna copy it in and we're gonna talk a little bit about what's going on here. So for starters, our payload is broken up into these two attributes, a block book and a back end. So our main struct that's going to process the status information from our payload is going to look like this. So you can see that we're basically creating those two fields as attributes, and we're actually making them data types of other structs. And that's how we're going to be able to create like structs embedded in this body here. So like this, you can basically look at the curly brackets. This is going to be one big struct, and inside of it, we're going to have a block book struct and a backend struct. So again, I'm going to utilize the copy paste, and I'm going to throw in my pre-built backend and block book struct. 
So bear with me one moment there. Now, once we've got these in here, you can see that I've had these commented out and that's because what's going on here is in order to be able to use these attributes in other areas of our Rust application, we need to make them public. And that's what this pub keyword is going to do. So we make the struct public and we make the attributes that we want to use public. Now in this particular application, I'm not going to use all of these attributes. I'm presenting them to you guys here so you can see like this is how you would do it if you wanted the full payload. But if you just omit these, Rust can still do the deserialization based on the name of your attribute. So it's super, super cool. Like if we only include coin in the block book set, like this is really only going to look for this particular attribute coin. And it's not going to care about the other stuff because the name doesn't line up. So it's really, really cool. It does that all automatically. But I encourage you guys, like I included these in the GitHub and in the video here, because if you want to mess around and like write more code and like build on top of this and experiment with some of these fields, it's that easy. But for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to comment these out to sort of preserve a little bit of memory and all of the warnings Russ is going to give you since these fields are never read. So now that we've got our structs, you can see the structure here is exactly the same as our JSON payload. And you can even see, like, I went ahead and did all of the variable types, the data types. So I went with strings for all the strings, obviously, and the Booleans for the Booleans. But anything that was a number, I just did an I-64. Pretty lazily, mostly because we're not using these. But you can feel free to go ahead and put in different size integers. You can do signed or unsigned, like whatever you want to do. I just went with I-64 for convenience and because I'm lazy. But anyway, so... This is super cool. We've got this set up to pull that JSON payload, but how do we actually tell Rust to do that? Like, does it just happen automatically? Do we just automatically pipe a response from a request into a struct? Well, kinda, yeah. All you have to do is tell Rust with what's called an annotation. So we're gonna add this annotation right above our struct here. And we're using that derive module that we saw on the cargo toml and deserialize is the trait we're going to use. So we're going to, because we're including this, Rust is going to be able to identify this struct as deserializable from JSON. And that's really all you got to do. You also want to add this annotation here so that Rust recognizes the camel case naming convention of the JSON. Now, if you don't know what camel case is, if you see how it's written here, the first word is a lowercase letter, and then any subsequent words that are part of that name they start with a capital letter. And you can see that that's how it's structured in each of our fields of the JSON payload. Awesome. So if we just make sure to include those annotations right above each of these structs, then we're good to go. And that's all there is to it. So we're going to do the same thing with the status endpoint like that we're doing here. We're going to do it with the other two endpoints that we talked about as well. So get address, right? Like here's all of the fields that we have for get address. Now, we'll go ahead and create a new file and we're gonna just call it blockchain address.rs. And again, we're gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna copy paste this in. You guys already know what these annotations are doing, so I'll include those. But take a look at this. This attribute here is actually a vector. Well, why is that a vector? Well. We talked about how vectors are very similar to lists and in Rust, that's basically what they are. And here for transaction IDs, we actually have a list of strings. So we can't just do one big string because it just wouldn't deserialize, right? Like we'd have multiple strings separated by commas that would get put into one string and we don't want that. So all you gotta do is make it a vector of strings. And now our vector will contain each of these transaction hashes. So that's pretty interesting too. Again, I commented out any attributes we're not going to need. We'll save that. And let's create our last file, which is going to be blocktrain transaction.rs. And just like before, I'm going to copy it in from what I have on GitHub. Feel free to do the same. And there it is. So let's take a look at that payload, make sure we're up to speed. So this payload is pretty large and like this one here, this transaction that I've queried here is on the smaller end. But if you just pay attention to the structure, 
it repeats, right? So like we have our main JSON payload with these three fields up here. And then if you just follow the lines all the way down, there's this additional field, the out, and then there's these ones down here. So we've represented all of those right here in the blockchain transaction struct. And then if you take a look at V out, we actually have an object here, another struct, which is going to have its own attributes. And you can see there's a list in here. So we're just lining all of that up. And so here's V out. We got a vector of strings like we saw already. Cool. And then V in, is very very similar. You can see if you don't if you're not familiar with JSON, you can see that each of these is an object with these curly brackets. And inside this like array syntax is actually a list of objects. And these are all going to be the same. You know, with like they're all objects of the VN attribute. So these are all the same and we're going to represent each of those objects with VN. And then you can see down here both of those are going to be vectors. So we got a vector of VNs and a vector of Vouts, and that'll allow us to capture this whole list of objects for each of these attributes. Awesome. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. If not, bear with me because when we start doing things with these structs, you'll see exactly what's happening and all of the magic that's going on behind the scenes. But the bottom line is, this is going to convert plain old JSON from a REST or HTTP request and put it into Rust objects to allow us to just write Rust code on it and do what we want with these values. So in the next video, we're gonna start laying down all of the functionality of the app and doing some stuff with these structs, and we'll take a look at the deserialization in real time.